Hello and welcome to uh, this program, Muhammad Ali Documenting a Legend. My name is Chris Wilson. I'm Director of Experience Design at the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian Institution and Director of our History Film Forum, our exploration of film as public history. This year, we've been so pleased to relaunch the History Film Forum as online programs with our partners at Smithsonian Associates, the world's most expansive museum-based education program that is now streaming. We've been thrilled to present screenings of some incredible films and host discussions with some amazing filmmakers who bring history to the screen. History that's not only about our past, but also that offers a way to understand our present and map out a better future. Tonight's film and guests certainly fill, uh, fit that description. I've had the pleasure to work with Ken Burns and his team many times from our National Youth Summit on the Dust Bowl, which, which featured Ken's film on that natural and human catastrophe, a youth town hall on the Roosevelt's, and at previous History Film Forum programs where we screened the first public clips of his and Lynn Novick's film, The Vietnam War. So we're extremely pleased and honored to again work with WETA, PBS, Florentine Films, and feature Muhammad Ali at the History Film Forum tonight. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we're so glad that you've, you've chosen to spend time with us. And we look forward to welcome you, welcoming you again to many future programs. And to our members and donors, thank you for your ongoing generosity, especially during these challenging times. You can find out more about upcoming programs on our website, smithsonianassociates.org, as well as on Facebook, Instagram, when they're working, and Twitter. You'll see the links in the chat box. And that is where we'll be posting resources as well throughout the program. So please take a moment to find that on your toolbar. While you're looking, make sure you find the Q&A box so you can po pose your questions to our special guests tonight. You may have also noticed that the program includes closed captioning. You may choose to hide that option by clicking on the CC icon on your toolbar. Now, every, every device is a little different, so let us know if you need any help by messaging us in the Q&A box. Finally, please take a moment to complete the exit survey at the end of the program. Uh, you'll, see, um, you'll see that we'll put up then. We appreciate and value your feedback and read every comment. We'd also like to thank Dan Manat and Democracy Films for the generous support of these programs. The film and subject we're going, we're going to discuss tonight, Muhammad Ali, a film by Ken Burns, Sarah Burns, and David McMahon, brings to life the iconic heavyweight boxing champion who became an inspiration to people everywhere. So Muhammad Ali is now streaming on PBS.org for free through October 9th. So make sure you catch it there and will continue to be uh, to be available through PBS uh, following the following that. Uh, but we'll need to you'll need to be members uh, in order to access it there. So try to try to see it while you can. We're going to start tonight's program with a short clip from the very beginning of Muhammad Ali, which I must say I thoroughly enjoyed, as I'm sure many of you did as well. You want some breakfast? I like some food. Can I have some of your food? Oh, I don't want none. I won't take none. I won't take none. I won't eat none if you don't want to. Oh, look at that pretty horse. Is that a white horse? See? Oh, now stand up. Look over there. Stand up. You got to stand up over that field. See the big one? There he is. My earliest memories that I can think of as a child with my father are walking through airports and being in crowds and, and feeling in my the vibrations of people's clapping and shouts in my chest. And just looking at my dad, you know, like, who is this person? And it was all the time, anywhere we went, you're the greatest, we love you, and the clapping, and Muhammad. Abu Abu I loved feeling all the energy and the love that he felt. 
We now think of Muhammad Ali as this vulnerable guy lighting the torch in Atlanta, and everybody on the globe loves him. Black people like him, white people. He's a universal hero, like, but almost in a religious way, like the Buddha. But when he was in the midst of his career, and not just in the early bit, he was incredibly divisive. Boo, yell, scream, throw peanuts, but whatever you do, pay to get in. People hated him, whether it was along racial lines, class lines, Vietnam lines, political lines, religious lines, where they just couldn't stand him. And people, of course, had the opposite, and this was, I loved him, loved him. But you had an opinion about him. Look how pretty I am. Trim legs and my beautiful arms and a pretty nose and mouth. I know I'm a pretty man. I know I'm pretty. You don't have to tell me I'm pretty. I'm cocky. I'm proud. Never talk about who's gonna stop me. Well, ain't nobody gonna stop me. I say what I want to say. Ain't no more big talk like this. He was a pioneer. He was a revolutionary. He was a groundbreaker. A guy known simply as the greatest. I am the greatest. I've wrestled with alligators. I've tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning and put thunder in jail. You know I'm bad. I can drown a drink of water and kill a dead tree. This will be no contest. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. To have that chutzpah and to be a black man in America was just, it was outlandish. Muhammad means worthy of all phrases and Ali means most high. And I just don't think I should go 10,000 miles in here and shoot some black people that never called me. I just can't shoot it. I always wonder why Miss America was always white. Santa Claus was white. White swan soap, king white soap, white cloud tissue paper, and everything bad was black. Black cat was the bad luck, and if I threaten you, I'm gonna blackmail you. <laughs> so mama wanted to call it white mail. They lied too. I love being around him. I love being around Muhammad Ali. You're gonna float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Ah, rumble, young man, rumble. Ah. The price of freedom comes high. I have paid, but I am free. Freedom, freedom, I can't move. Freedom, cut me loose. The winner freedom, and still heavyweight champion of the world. I'm the greatest man of all time. Of all time. Keep on running cause the winner don't quit on themselves He called himself the greatest and then proved it to the entire world. He was a master at what is called the sweet science, the brutal and sometimes beautiful art of boxing. Heavyweight champion of just 22 years old, he wrote his own rules in the ring and in his life infuriating his critics, baffling his opponents, and riveting millions of fans. At the height of the civil rights movement, he joined a separatist religious sect whose leader would, for a time, dominate both his personal life and his boxing career. He spoke his mind and stood on principle even when it cost him his livelihood. He redefined black manhood yet belittled his greatest rival using the racist language of the Jim Crow South in which he had been raised. Banished for his beliefs, he returned to boxing an underdog, reclaimed his title twice, and became the most famous man on earth. He craved adulation his whole life, seeking crowds on street corners, in hotel lobbies, on airport tarmacs, everywhere he went, and revel in the uninhibited joy he brought each adoring fan. He earned a massive fortune, spent it freely, and gave generously to family, friends, even strangers, anyone in need. Service to others, he often said, is the rent you pay for your room here on Earth. Even after his body began to betray him and his brain had absorbed too many blows, he fought on, unable to go without the attention and drama that accompanied each bout. Later, 
slowed and silenced by a cruel and crippling disease, he found refuge in his faith, becoming a symbol of peace and hope on every continent. Muhammad Ali was, the novelist Norman Mailer wrote, the very spirit of the 20th century. I'm always gonna be one black one who got big on your white televisions, on your white newspapers, on your satellites, million dollar checks, and still look you in your face and tell you the truth and 100% stay with and represent my people and not leave them and sell them out because I'm rich and stay with them. That was my purpose. I'm here and I'm showing the world that you can be here and still free and stay yourself and get respect from the world. I just absolutely loved that opening and uh, felt like Larry Holmes. I love being around Muhammad Ali in this film, among many other emotions, made me feel that. Now I'm honored to say that we will be joined by our interviewer, Faith Davis Ruffins. Faith is the curator of African American history and culture at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. She's a specialist on African-American cultural history and on, and on ethnic imagery in advertising and popular entertainment. She has curated and consulted on major African-American exhibitions at the Smithsonian and else, elsewhere. And she has published widely on the history of how African-Americans have preserved and presented their own history from the early 1800s to today. And in the early planning phases of the Muhammad Ali Museum in Louisville, Faith worked as a consultant with the museum's architect and the interpretive development team. During that process, she spent time with Ali and his wife, Ms. Mrs. Lani Ali. However, she first met, she first met uh, Ali on one of his college tours in the early 1970s. I'm sure that she will share some of her own personal as well as historical insight tonight. Please welcome to the Zoom stage, Faith Davis Ruffins. Hello, thank you for coming. Uh, it's wonderful to be here to talk about Muhammad Ali, one of the incredible figures of the 20th century who lived into the 21st century. Let's, I'm going to start by introducing our two wonderful guests, Ken Burns, a documentary filmmaker for 40 years who essentially needs no introduction. I will say that it's uh, an interesting thought as a historian is that Burns has been called not only the greatest documentarian of the day, but also the most influential, most influential filmmaker period. That includes feature filmmakers like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. One critic, David Zarawick wrote, I say this because Burns has not only turned millions of people onto history with his films, he showed us a new way of looking at our collective past and ourselves. Thank you for being here, Ken Burns. Thank you, Faith. We're also joined by Sarah Burns. Sarah is the author of The Central Park Five, A Chronicle of a City Wilding, which was published in 2011, along with David McMahon and Ken Burns, the producer, writer, and director of the documentary Central Park Five, about five Black and Latino teenagers who were wrongly convicted in the famous Central Park Jogger case in 1989. That film premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 2012 and was named the best nonfiction film of the New York Film Critics Circle and won a 2013 Peabody Award. She has produced, and I can't read her entire resume, a four-hour documentary on Jackie, Jackie Robinson and uh, has been nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Writing for a Nonfiction Program. She most recently released East Lake Meadows, a public history, a public housing story, which premiered on PBS in March of 2020. She's currently working on a film about Leonardo da Vinci. Welcome, Sarah Burns. Thank you well, for having me. While we're waiting, thank you. While we're waiting for questions from the audience, I'm going to start off with a couple of questions uh, to get the ball rolling. Um, I'm old enough, of course, to remember much of Muhammad Ali's career. I'm, 
I was younger than he was, but uh, I I was around uh, as a child for the 1960 Olympics, and uh, which was televised in part, not at the wall to wall that we have today, but it was televised. And I think one of the most interesting things about this uh, series of films is that you really show how Muhammad Ali's, the image that Muhammad Ali had, which one could argue he doesn't change, but how people perceived him changed very dramatically over the course of his life. When he was younger, many people hated Muhammad Ali. He's now thought of as being this great uh, iconic man, but during his lifetime, especially the early and middle years of his career, that was not true. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I think I think you're, you hit the nail on the head. I too remember the 1960 Olympics and him winning gold and being this sort of charismatic figure that emerges from the pack of uh, American athletes, uh, many of them as famous as they get. Yeah, David uh, Remnick, the writer and editor in the opening that you just saw, refers to him as you know this beloved figure, which he was, like a Buddha, which he was, uh, but how divisive he also was. I'd rather flip it on its head and, and sort of challenge the rest of America to say, you know, maybe it was we who were divisive, that we didn't trust that a black man could make a spiritual decision, have a faith decision not to fight in the war. No one could see it as that. They could see it only as a kind of a political gesture, a kind of middle finger to the United States. And so he was definitely reviled, not just for that, but for his uh, admission that he was a member of a separatist religious cult, the Nation of Islam, uh, for being loud and, and braggadocio and not being the way an athlete, particularly a black athlete, should behave. So he's got a lot of things going against him, and yet all of those things seem to us now pretty standard, pretty uh, acceptable, and it, it took us to grow. I think we, Remnick says towards the end of the film, maybe maybe we get better as people. Maybe it shows that we can change. So I think the Muhammad Ali is exactly Faith as you suggested, one of the most compelling figures in the history of the United States. He intersects with all the major themes of the last half of the 20th century. These are themes that are with us today that we're talking about and we're debating. And so we can find in the study of Muhammad Ali a kind of perfect subject, uh, a perfect mirror, and a, and a perfect example uh, a pole star of, of what to aim for. I mean, he's just irresistible as a character. <laughs> Would you like to comment, Sarah? Well, I, I agree. I mean, I think that he really, I think he actually does evolve. So I think it's important, it's really important to see the way that he's that mirror and the way that we change in how we think about him. Um, but he also evolves himself, you know, certainly his faith evolves. I think we can think about his, the arc of his life as a spiritual journey. And that certainly changes from the early days of sort of parroting Elijah Muhammad's um, version of the, the Nation of Islam's sort of tenets um, to later on when he embraces a much more global sort of orthodox version of Islam. Um, and, and in many ways in his life, I think he does evolve. He also acknowledges later on some of the mistakes that he made, some of his own flaws um, and tries to atone for those things. And so he actually famously said, the man who at 50 is the same as he was at 20 has wasted 30 years of his life. Well, we've got an interesting question from a visitor, which is for a man who um, in, in, my, in my age group, going and listening to these films, was, was seeing these films was uh, a trip through memory lane because I lived through so many of these times and what they look like and these statements that he made. But for a younger person who maybe lived through less of this, maybe more of the life, uh, more of your life, he was, uh, Sarah, he was the older man, the man who has a disease. For both of you, what surprised you in making this film? What surprised you as you went through the, uh, the life of a man who is very iconic and much of his life is on film, is documented, but they're surprises. What were they for you? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, I think for us in, in coming from different generations, obviously had different um, experiences in what we brought to our knowledge of Ali's life. So for me, I was not, I didn't, I mean, you can't not know about Muhammad Ali, but I was certainly not an expert and I hadn't watched the fights. Um, I'd been, I was, I was born after he retired. 
And so for me, my sense, as you suspect, mm -hmm. was that, you know, I, I knew about the, I remember the 96 Olympics and him lighting the torch and that, you know, I was sort of aware of him. Um, but for me, this making the film as it all as is always the case when we we make a film it's a process of discovery and so even when when it's something we do know something about coming into we have to kind of start with a blank slate and and begin that process our research process um by trying to discover who this person is what the context is and really understand in a new way and try to go into it and and find some new level, some new depth to the story that even if we knew something about it, we hadn't discovered. So I think um, there's a few things. I mean, I think that I was struck really early on in the process of talking to lots of people about this. As soon as we started telling people we were working on this film, it felt like everyone had a Muhammad Ali story, that anyone you talk to had some <laughs> way that they were touched by Muhammad Ali. They bumped into him in an elevator once. I saw him on a street corner. He signed an autograph. He responded to a letter um, and, and often much more involved stories than that. Everyone felt like they were his best friend. But that was something that I think I hadn't appreciated in terms of his generosity of spirit and the way that he just shared this love that he had for all people with everyone he encountered. He would stay and sign every last autograph and he would, for someone who we in, in some ways can think of as this narcissist, this person with a big ego, this incredibly famous person who likes to talk about how pretty he is and how he's the greatest, that he actually had this incredible ability to share himself with other people and to make other people feel seen and feel special. And that that, I think, may actually be his greatest talent, more so than as a boxer. That's just one thing, though, of a million things that I learned and that surprised me in, in working on this. Sarah's absolutely right. I mean, I think each each film we make is a process of discovery, and it's also a discipline uh, to let go of all the, the preconceptions and baggage you have and sort of recreate, in the best sense of that word, who that person is and liberate yourself from the tyranny of those preconceptions. And so every day is a discovery, and, and I was really stuck struck as Sarah was by the the love this is you know at at, at its base it's this is a story of freedom um, about a person as you heard in the end of the introduction who wishes to be free who as a black man in America it's incredibly difficult to achieve that kind of freedom but who nonetheless wished to bring along everyone with him which is really unusual and incredibly brave which brings you to the next theme which is about courage uh, not just inside the ring. This is an incredibly difficult sport, and what he did inside the ring is spectacular. The collected fights that we we show in the fi in the process of the film, and by far the film is not only about the fights, are like the collected works of William Shakespeare. But this is also about love, which is a very difficult word to talk about, and he seemed to spread it. You don't die the most beloved person on your planet without doing the kinds of things that Sarah said. And so I was always interested in the fact that even in moments when he was supposed to be this way or conventional wisdom suggested that he was only this way, he was exhibiting from a very early age a wisdom and a poise, a sense of purpose, a sense of knowing that he had a mission of, of finding once he had launched his spiritual journey. As Sarah said, it was an evolutionary process. And everywhere along the line, there was footage that we would discover that would shock you with how wise this 19 year old was or how wise this 22 year old was or how wise this 26 year old was just startling in a, in a way that kind of woke you up and reminds us all and i think this is what he did around the world is he he made us as sarah said you know he made people feel seen he recognized you and he never put himself above anyone else and so that made you wish to sort of draft along in his greatness. And, and you can't ever be that great, but you can you can draft along with it. And, and because he was so complicated with many, many dark sides and yet was willing to work on them, he becomes a, a really co a complete hero in a way so many figures in American history are, are impossibly opaque or impossibly, you know, sugar-coated and sanitized and Madison Avenue versions, and he's not that. 
you've got to deal in order to deal with yourself you have to deal with a lot of stuff in order to deal with muhammad ali you're going to come in contact with almost every major theme that's animated american life since the beginning of america even though his passage is relatively short uh in the last 70 years or so well you brought up a whole series of issues in those comments um i'm going to follow up on several i'm going to start uh, with uh, the idea that everyone has a Muhammad Ali story. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you one of mine yet, but I'm going to tell you when I was working uh, as a consultant, and when I told people they were, I was working on the Muhammad Ali project that later became this museum, people would tell me their Muhammad Ali stories, which uh, is a sign of a truly uh, uh, a figure that even people who are famous want to get to know. Uh, people who, are in their, who themselves are famous uh, want to get to know. But in any event, this, this actually was a professor um, of Islam. And uh, I won't say where, at a major university. And uh, he, he was, happened to be in a first class section of a plane. Um, this is after Ali has retired. And he goes up to him, you know, we might think one of the millions of people Ali has met and says to him, you know, Mr. Mr. Muhammad Ali, you know, we, we met before. And what does Ali say? People must say this to him all the time. He says, oh, was that you? <laughs> what a great story. Was that you? <laughs> How much practice had he had in saying that? For people who have met him, but of course he couldn't possibly remember. That's is that story. you? So uh, they're, they're, one of the things that is indubitable about Muhammad Ali is that he was in control of his own image. Mm. He couldn't change how people responded to it, but he remained in full control uh, of his image as a celebrity and as an icon. And that's extraordinary in that period because there are a lot of uh, African-Americans and some other people as well, too, uh, who become very famous but very much are not in control of mm. what is, uh, uh, of how they are, how they want to put themselves across. You might have liked him, you might have hated him, but he was putting himself across in the way that he wanted to. He was in control of it. Yeah. And that was extraordinary and is part of what I think others, particularly African Americans and particularly young men, saw as being so free. Yes. The idea that he could say and do what he wanted to. That feeling of freedom is a feeling that many African-Americans never have because of the constraints of American society. So one of the questions that someone has asked is, this is in the context of control of his image, how close or distant was he really to Howard Cosell? This is a question a lot of people ask. What, what really was the relationship between Howard Cosell and um, Muhammad Ali, at least from your assessment? Yeah, I don't know that they were actually incredibly close personally, right? I think that they recognized in each other and in this sort of partnership that they had in some ways that they could benefit each other. And that their, you know, their banter, the, all those interviews over the years was really good for both of them. Um, I think Howard Cosell was one of the earlier white sportscasters to treat Ali, to, to use his name, his chosen name, Muhammad Ali, or his given name by Elijah Muhammad, um, when so many other people, especially white sports writers, were still calling him Cassius Clay. And so I think that earned him some... Uh, respect from Ali and then they and then Cosell knew that by having this relationship with Ali that he could um, you know increase his own popularity his own career um, and so I think that they were good for each other and they knew that uh, were they having dinner with their families on the weekends no <laughs> But I think, Faith, I also just want to say, I think you make a great point about how he was in control of his image. And I think even when he was performing, 
right? So much of, especially early on in his career, he is performing, he's boasting, he's clowning, he's talking about what round he's going to knock out his opponent in his upcoming fight. And he is the greatest boxing promoter of all time, who was not even a boxing <laughs> promoter, that wasn't his job, and he was better at it than the promoters. Um, but I also think he was really authentically himself, even in those moments when he was performing. And I think that's part of what made that so inspiring, as you're suggesting, was that he was himself and he was insisting on being himself all the time. So even in those moments, he is he is reflecting something about who he really is. And sometimes that's the boasting and the the um, bragging. And sometimes that's, as I was saying earlier, this incredible wisdom about his life and about what's going on around him. And all of those things are really authentically him. Can you hear a comment, Kim? No, I think that's, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I, I do think it's interesting. There are lots of documentaries on Muhammad Ali, and many of them focus on a particular fight or years, and we wanted to do something that was more comprehensive, which means we got to grow with him. We got to see a tentativeness and early... Uh, kind of resistance to sort of acting out. His father was a bitter uh, race man, and so he understood the limitations of being, but he grew up uh, not that much younger than Emmett Till saw, as every black American did, and so many others did, the open casket that uh, Emmett Till's mom had the bravery to show the world of this brutalized, tortured, mutilated uh, body, um, which is, you know, um, unfortunately not the first or the last person who has ended up that way. Um, and he, you know, in the early days when he had white sponsors, um, he's, he, there's a kind of tentativeness. And I, I really loved accompanying his blossoming, you know, that he comes into his own, he finds his voice. A lot of it comes from the, the, the very strong foundation that the Nation of Islam and the Elijah Muhammad is able to give him. He's able to use this in a way to sort of enlarge his own uh, confidence, his own worldview, and and then and then that projection of himself into the world. But as Sarah said, the most important thing is no matter the manifestation, he is being resolutely himself. And so, what's so amazing is that anybody who's human picks up on that authenticity regardless of who you are. Maybe it's threatening to you. It's really difficult if you're a white racist to sort of deal with this guy who says, you know, I've had, a, had a 180 amateur fights, I've had 22 professional fights, and I'm pretty as a girl. You know, this is, this is going to be challenging for you. Right. And you're just going to have to get over it. But um, for so many of us, it meant something that, that it planted a seed of kind of aspiration within us in whatever form that might take. And that's what just makes him, for me, so transcendent of every, even his own manifestations. There seems to be some, as he says it, you know, I, you know, he's musing about the fact that he's in great tension because the Nation of Islam and doesn't look on sports, they see it as frivolous, and here their most famous member is the greatest athlete in the world, and he's wrestling with this, and he said, well, maybe I won't box anymore, but I know I'm here for a purpose. So, like, irre you can pull out the boxing from this person, and he knows that he's here for a purpose, and that is just... It's, I think it's spectacular to, to, to have had the privilege over the last several years to sort of go along that journey. Not just the chronological journey, but the spiritual journey, the athletic journey, the race journey, the, the political journey, the, uh, the personal journey, the, you know, the, the husband, the lover, the father, all of those journeys are themselves unique and and fascinating and part of this you know amazing human being i can't think of any, maybe louis armstrong is, is in american history that has that kind of dynamics and dimensions you know whose whose wings uh, angel wings are as wide as 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 anybody's that's an interesting comparison uh armstrong there are a lot of questions and I'm going to try and get to them. One, several people have asked you to comment on his relationship with Malcolm X. Of course, he had a <clears throat> initially close relationship with Malcolm X before and in the early days of uh, joining, the officially joining 
the Nation of Islam, but uh, Malcolm X, who was also on his own spiritual journey, um, had made some discoveries that, um, uh, uh, and he made the the uh, Hajj, the sacred trip to Mecca, and had come to some new conclusions. And those things, uh, in his own mind, forced him to separate from Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable, and um, uh, Muhammad Ali stuck with um, the Nation of Islam and and uh, rejected, in a sense, uh, Ma Malcolm X, which later in his life, uh, there's some commentary and you have wonderful uh, people speaking in this film. I mean, it's rare a film where you get historians and boxers and writers and sports writers and TV hosts and people to, to, to speak. But um, would you like to comment on uh, this, the evolution of his uh, relationship with Malcolm X, which I believe was part of his spiritual journey? Mm -hmm. Sure, it, it absolutely was. And I think it's, it's right, as you suggested, that he, this is one of the greatest regrets in his life was the way that he turned his back on Malcolm X. He was really caught in between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. And there was, I think they both represented these incredibly important, they were both mentors to him. Um, Elijah Muhammad was like a father figure and Malcolm X like an older brother in a lot of ways, um, certainly in his spiritual journey. And when, when they split, Ali was really caught. He was actually still Cassius Clay at that time. And he was really caught yeah. in between them and I had to make that decision. And I think there's a lot of factors that are um, complicated. I think that he, that there's potentially fear is one of those factors that he understood that what ultimately happened to Malcolm X could be, I mean, that, that he was, that leaving the fold of the nation of Islam was not an easy thing to do. Um, and Elijah Muhammad was such an important figure in his life that it was hard to say no. Elijah Muhammad also bestowed upon him this name, Muhammad Ali, right in that moment. And that may have been, I think, I, I mean, I think was clearly part of this kind of power play to keep him in the fold of the nation of Islam. Um, and I think that may have been a factor in, in him staying. But yeah, absolutely, uh, Malcolm X's own spiritual evolution uh, what he learned about Islam, the sort of larger global uh, version of Islam, of which the nation of Islam has, you know, borrowed aspects, but was not truly uh, Islam in the traditional sense. Um, Ali eventually got there too, uh, but it took him it took him some time, and I think that's part of what made him um, regret his choice at that time was that he really came, he ended up in the same place that I think Malcolm X did. Uh, it just took him longer to get there and to understand those things about where the nation of Islam had diverged from global Islam. Yes, I think one of the really interesting commentaries on this is from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who really talks about how um, a number of people who uh, begin in the nation of Islam, uh, make a spiritual journey and end up uh, following uh, Elijah Muhammad's, uh, one of his sons, Warif Muhammad, into the uh, form of Orthodox Islam. Any other comments you want to make on that? No, no. I, I think Sarah uh, really nailed it. It's, it's a sad thing. Um, you know, Malcolm X is assassinated by the nation of Islam. They're they're, they're diverging already. He has political interests. Uh, the Nation of Islam really wishes to be less political and more kind of organizational and community-based. And uh, he's famous and, and then begins to recognize correctly aspects of corruption within the Nation of Islam. Uh, and so it's untenable. And I think it's really this very uh, fraught moment where this young, young man 
uh, who has who adores Malcolm X and has befriended him, but has this sort of tighter relationship um, or this control relationship coming from uh, Elijah Muhammad has to make this you know, impossible Sophie's choice. And uh, I think Elijah Muhammad very shrewdly makes it easier to make that choice. Uh, one, by bestowing the name, as Sarah said, and also by, as she also said, the, the kind of the fear that must be there in a, in a very young kid uh, wondering what's going to happen to him. And it's not that much longer before uh, Malcolm X is assassinated and assassinated by members of the Nation of Islam. Um, another uh interesting aspect of the film and there are people who'd like you to answer questions like how long did it take to make the film what were the obstacles you faced in making the film one of them must have been 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 uh, finances because a lot of this film is owned by other people <laughs> and is uh, highly sought after <laughs> um but uh one of the things i was very interested to see in the film is you were able to get two of his former wives uh uh, to speak um, uh, for on the camera as well as uh, two of his daughters. So I'd like you, as you talk about how long it took to make the film and what obstacles you faced, if you talk a little bit about how you were able to get the participation mm -hmm. of uh, members of, let's call them his extended family. Yeah, we had, right, the, the second wife, Khalila Ali, and the, his third wife, Veronica Porsche, um, and two of his daughters, Hannah Ali and Rashida Ali, and also his brother, Rachman, all appear in the film. And that was, um, it was important to us to have these eyewitnesses, to have his family members who are eyewitnesses, not just to the boxing and the entourage and all of these other aspects of his life, but who he was at home. And also what the impact of his complicated and sometimes turbulent family life was. So, you know, you have both of these wives who ultimately divorced him um, in large part because of his infidelities um, and his daughters who, you know, struggled with the fact that they didn't get to spend as much time with him because those marriages ended, because there were new marriages and new families and, um, that's, I think, a really important part of understanding Ali, and we were not going to shy away from his flaws and what makes this a complicated story for them and their experiences. Um, in approaching them, you know, it was really just about explaining that what we wanted to do was something that told the whole story. It was not just focused on one chapter, that was not just about Muhammad Ali, the boxer, that was going to treat him as a three-dimensional person who was, yes, an athlete, a boxer, but also who was a man of faith, who was a family man, a flawed family man, um, and that all of these different, you know, the, about his courage, about his draft resistance, about all of these different elements of his life, and that we wanted to understand him um, with some depth, with some complexity, and that their stories were an important part of that. Um, and I think that's why they all agreed to talk to us. Um, and I think it's really important to have their voices in there, their perspective on this. I mean, we're always looking for new perspectives on a story. So sh we're definitely going to talk to those people who maybe you've heard from before about Ali, journalists who covered his early career, people who knew him well. Um, <clears throat> but we're also, we want to hear from people who have some different kinds of perspectives and a variety of different perspectives um, that's going to help us in creating that three-dimensional portrait and so that's a big part of it but yes to the the broader question about the process um we spend you know the first part of our process is this gathering period where we film those interviews we write our script we do research in newspapers books articles um, and we gather huge amounts of archival material, um, hundreds, I mean, we collected more than 500 hours of footage and more than 15,000 photographs. That's just what we entered into our system to make available to our editors, um, plus music, lots of contemporary music to make all of that available. And then we begin our editing process where we sort of take all of that way too much material um, and boil it down. It becomes a subtractive process where we 
take something that is the script is too long. We have an incredible wealth of choices when it comes to archival material, and we figure out what serves the story, what helps us understand Muhammad Ali better, and what doesn't, what doesn't work. Sometimes things that you are sure are going to be amazing and are, are going to be these important stories, and they fall out because they don't work within this larger arc of telling the story. Um, then we spend 14 months on our edit to figure that out and to boil it down and to get you know, just the best stuff that helps us tell that story. That's it. That's exactly the process. It's, I'm in on, yeah, how easy. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, you know, I can tell you one. Go little, ahead. Let me tell you just one little story. Um, the opening of the film um, is a scene of him stealing cornflakes from his daughter, his oldest child, Miriam. Yeah. Um, that was safely embedded yes. deep into our third episode and was working perfectly. And I don't think any of us were ever thinking of moving it in the course of the editing. But there was also a sense that Hana and the sense of the reverberation of people yelling, Ali, you're the greatest in her chest as this early memory wasn't quite enough for us to do what Sarah just described us wanting to do. Yes, this is a boxer. Yes, this is this complicated political figure, whatever it is, but this is a whole human being. And what could be more? So we exported that thing out of its perfect position in the middle of episode three to begin the film, but it really sets the tone. You suddenly, there's, first of all, there's no parent on earth that hasn't, or at least a father being one of four, hasn't, you know, said, look over there and stolen French fries or, or cornflakes or some such thing uh, off the plate. And so what we did was instantly humanize him and say, look, from the very beginning, we're interested in who this is too and we can then in the uh, in the ex exposition of the of the introduction get into the complexities of of the biography in all of its uh, aspects but we also want to know who this human being is and so that that uh, boiling down maybe because he's from Louisville Kentucky that distillation of all that material that we that we collect is central to who we are. And it is not an added, we're not building a house unless you've brought 200 times as much building material to the construction site. We like are, we are removing. It is subtractive in every sense of the word. And that's very hard to impress upon people. They think you can just, oh, build a film. And you know, we probably started editing it last Tuesday and here we are tonight and it's done. It is, as Sarah said, as long. And, so it's it's um, it's seven years of work, um, and it is you know really intense at times, and and the cutting room floor is not filled with bad stuff. It's all filled with really wonderful stuff that all of us have to somehow I don't know accept uh, that it's not there, honor the negative space of creation that couldn't get into that that sculpture it's it's a it's a pretty wonderful process and and incredibly difficult to do because after a while you're imposing on the material but then after a while you have to listen to the material and it will tell you what it needs and and it will also tell you what it doesn't need and a, and a and a filmmaking process is like you know lots of organ rejection nope we're not taking that anymore that thing that you were in love with not anymore <laughs> Well, one of the things I think is very powerful about the film is that it does, it's a series of films, but I'll just call it the films. Um, it does, the through line is him as a person mm -hmm. and a person who's on a life journey and a spiritual journey and a journey in other ways. And yes, he's flawed in various ways, um, uh, but he's also a figure who struggles uh, with uh, spiritual issues. And I bring this up because I think one of my great impressions of him later in his life was the power of spirituality uh, coming from him. Even as he did little things that he had always done, like little magic tricks, and even as he, uh, you know, it was harder and harder for him to speak, the spirituality really, really comes through. Um, in this context, uh, it'd be interesting to have you just comment on, obviously, or maybe it's not so obvious to people who are younger, 
But his stand on the Vietnam War, his opposition to being drafted for the Vietnam War, which I might add was a very clearly political act because he had earlier been ruled that he wasn't um, fit to be into, fit to be put into the military. But uh, <clears throat> for students of the Vietnam War, we know that as the war went on, there was a greater and greater need for more and more men. And they began to reclassify people. But since draft boards were very local, it was clearly that the Louisville draft board had decided that Mahat, this was a way to um, contain, possibly even silence, Muhammad Ali. And when he takes that step outside the ring, I think many of your commentators would agree uh, and say, speak to this point that he moves beyond sports. Um, he moves beyond athletics in a, in a, a spiritual way. I mean, athletics is a complicated set of things, particularly when you have the Olympics thrown in there, but he moves into a directly uh, moral and ethical, he takes a step that risks his career uh, at the height had he been able to fight during the uh, years that he was fighting in court, had he able to box, boxing history, maybe might have been in the court. I mean, who, it's it's hard to know, but he certainly steps away at the height of his career for on a moral and ethical question. Just your thoughts on 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 um, on that point. It might be good to just show yeah. another clip, the mm -hmm. uh, mechanical memory clip at this point. And, uh, and, and, okay. and maybe uh, that will, uh, you know, remind us of the dimensions of the, of the courage and the struggle that you face so um, beautifully stated. Um, and if it's possible to run that clip, that would be great. Two weeks later, an all-white Houston jury found Ali guilty of refusing the draft. The judge, ignoring the more lenient recommendation of the prosecutor, sentenced him to the maximum, five years in prison and a $10,000 fine. And he would have to surrender his passport. Ali's lawyers immediately filed an appeal, prepared to go all the way to the Supreme Court if necessary a process that could take years. Ali remained free, but without his title or a license to box. He fully expected that he would one day go to jail for his beliefs. We who are followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the religion of Islam, we believe in obeying the laws of the land. We are taught to obey the laws of the land as long as it don't conflict with our religious beliefs. Will you go into service as such? This would be a thousand percent against the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the religion of Islam, and the Holy Quran, the holy book that we believe in. This will all be denouncing and define everything that I stand for. This would mean, of course, that you stand the chance of going to jail as a result of not going into service. You well, whatever the punishment, whatever the persecution is for standing up for my religious beliefs, even if it means facing machine gun fire that day, I will face it before denouncing Elijah Muhammad and the religion of Islam. I'm ready to die. When I think about him saying, if they want to put me before a firing squad tomorrow, I'm ready to die before I abandon my religion. Um, that's it. You can't teach that kind of thing in lectures, in books. That kind of thing has to be modeled. And models turn into traditions. And traditions provide people with the mechanical memory to do the right thing. That's what Muhammad Ali represented in that moment. I mean, anybody now faced with a major decision in which the right way is clear and the wrong way is clear, but the consequences are dire, now they have a model that they can fall back on psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. That's what Muhammad Ali represented in that moment. And that, to me, that moment will live on forever.
he he uh, 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 sums it up. That commentator sums it up, and is a is actually a wonderful person because um, he comments a lot about uh, Islam and the 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 journey of is of people of Islamic faith in the United States. We're 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 coming close to the end of our hour, and I, uh, it's maybe time to ask some of those questions. Of course. Ken Burns, you're famous for these big topics, the Civil War, jazz, baseball, Vietnam, things, national parks, things that represent or are consequential to understanding the American experiences and the American nation. How do you think Muhammad Ali as a subject matter tells us about America? What does his life and his his experiences tell us about America and ourselves? Well, I think that this is about as perfect a subject as we could have possibly taken on of all the subjects we've done. As I said before, he intersects with all the major themes of the last half of the 20th century. And those themes are, are right there. You know, what is the role of uh, uh, sports in society, what is the role of the black athlete, what is the nature of black masculinity and black manhood, uh, what is the nature of the civil rights movement, not as a one thing, not as something that gets painted into a corner by our conventional wisdom, but a living, breathing, dynamic, changing, evolving civil rights movement. Um, what is the story of race in America, what is about politics, about war, about sex, about faith, about religion, about Islam. I mean, okay, that's enough. Right then and there, and then you have a person who is dominating all of that period in a particularly um, amazing way because he's operating on all the levels, the level of the resistance to the draft, the level of, the, uh, of, of being at the height of his craft. I mean, there is no greater athlete, period in American history, if not world history, than Muhammad Ali. And then you have all these other dynamics, all these other eddies, all these whirlpools, all this undertow, the dynamics of the personal life, the relationship with the nation of Islam, with Malcolm X, with you know friends, with uh, other boxers, with his defeats. These are hugely important. The drama of the fights alone, as other filmmakers have proven in wonderful, wonderful films, are, are just, you cannot make this up. The first <laughs> listing fight, the first Frazier fight, the third Frazier fight, the, the, the fight against George Foreman in Kinshasa, the, all of these things are just, you know, if you, if you went into a Hollywood producer, they'd say it didn't, can't, it doesn't happen this way. You know, it's why doing this, you realize that every Rocky film is like, yeah, so what, you know, because each one of these is, is so dramatically dynamic and true. Nothing had to be made up about what takes place. And that's just one aspect of the film. So uh, this is, you know, some, uh, this is a subject firing on all cylinders. And, you know, and, and he's, <laughs> we need him as much today as, as we needed him then. I mean, remember growing up and he was such a hero for his stance on the Vietnam War in my family, such a hero for his uh, willingness to speak out in support of uh, black empowerment. Um, it was incredibly inspirational and there's nothing diminished now, 60 years later uh, in that, nothing diminished. And in fact, if anything, it increases because there's momentum to, that takes it on because we're not, we're not in any way tied to him alive. He's now gone, but influencing in, in very powerful ways. I wonder, which also makes me think with what you're mentioning now, whether if we have time, it makes sense to look at one more clip because we have one that is from towards the end of the film that really is thinking about what his exactly. legacy is and, and where we can kind of see him today in our current moment um, and his influence. And that's the one that's called um, Couldn't Be Undone. So maybe if we can, if we have time to watch that one more, it might be a nice way to cap off that conversation too. Ali, late in life, talked about this tallying angel, he called it, that there was an angel up there who counted all the good things you did in life and all the bad things you did in life. And if you had more bad things than good things, you were going to hell. And he had a very vivid impression of what hell meant. And he acknowledged that he had 
a lot of negative marks that the tallying angel was not going to be uh, happy with the way he had treated women in particular. 30 years after Ali first faced Joe Frazier, a reporter asked him about their long-running feud. I called him a lot of names that I shouldn't have called him, Ali admitted. I apologize for that. I like Joe Frazier. Me and him was a good show. Frazier never forgave Ali. Later, he expressed sorrow at having abandoned Malcolm X. Turning my back on Malcolm was one of the mistakes that I regret most in my life, he wrote. I wished I'd been able to tell Malcolm I was sorry that he was right about so many things. Daddy evolved, he became better. And Daddy said that I'm bigger than boxing. That meant boxing was this much. His evolution into the person he is today is way bigger than him just boxing. And I think he knew that. And he carried it with him, his love. And he gave it to every single person he met. And I think that's beautiful. As the 20th century came to an end, Newsweek, Time, and Sports Illustrated all named him Athlete of the Century. In the days after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, American Muslims were the victims of hate crimes simply because of their faith. I am a Muslim. I am an American, Ali responded. If the culprits are Muslim, they have twisted the teachings of Islam. Whoever performed the terrorist attacks does not represent Islam. God is not behind assassins. What I hope is that Muhammad Ali will be a constant reminder uh, uh, to America of just how thoroughly American a believing, practicing, sincerely committed Muslim can be. Whatever one's background is, Ali belongs to America, all of us. And I think that he belongs to all of us because he affected all of us. And I hope that that's part of the legacy that he will leave, that America won't forget Ali as this American Muslim with, with equal emphasis on American Muslim. On November 9, 2005, President George W. Bush presented Ali with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the United States. That same year, the Muhammad Ali Center, a museum dedicated to his life and legacy, opened in Louisville. Muhammad Ali was an activist who fought to reach us a certain way and to move America in a certain way, and to move individuals in a certain way. I'm going to take this path. I believe that I'm right. And even if I'm not right, I'm still me. And to be able to follow that and to know that there was going to be an enormous price to pay for that and to have that be generational, to have that live on beyond you is extremely valuable. Everything that he did couldn't be undone. Um, the, the film uh, has so many subtleties. Films have so many subtleties, and part of these come from the uh, range of commentators that you that you brought. Uh, of course, this film focuses on an iconic Black American historical figure. <clears throat> However, as you know, in August, uh, there are a number of criticisms came from filmmakers of color asking you re whether you. Uh, uh, considered your your role in this film, Ken, as white producer privilege, and you said no, and vowed to do a better job in terms of empowerment and representation representation behind the camera. Can you tell us about your process and commitment to supporting diversity among creators of historical films? Yes, yeah, certainly. I'm in the business of history. I've been all my life 
and that includes the history of everyone. And I have, throughout my professional life, tried to tell the story of this country in an inclusive way. And that means, of course, talking about race and trying to tell stories from multiple perspectives. And we do that with teams of producers, editors, and advisors who are diverse. And the people in our film are from all different kinds of backgrounds and speak to their personal experiences as experts. And we, of course, encourage and have emphasized to even our funders that we'd like them to divert their resources uh, to a variety of filmmakers and allow others to tell their stories and celebrate that storytelling. But I don't accept that only people of a particular background can tell certain stories about the past. You know, I'm reminded of a quote by Martin Luther King who said, all life is interrelated. All people are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. My entire professional career, we've reached out. The diversity of this particular team, the nucleus of this team is um, the same sort of percentage that it was when we made jazz uh, more than 20 years ago. So, you know, we don't think that you can make a topic uh, off limits, but I do respect wholeheartedly the impulse that not enough people are getting the opportunity to tell their stories. PBS has been, ironically, probably the most open of all the networks, uh, but, it, but it is also pledged to do a better job and has asked all of those who produce for PBS, and I represent a tiny, minuscule niche uh, in that, and I get a far fewer percentage dollars from PBS for my films than other filmmakers do uh, because we go out and raise money from mm -hmm. other people to just just recommit ourselves uh, to the spirit uh, uh, of inclusion and diversity and equity. And so that's what we've always done and we will continue to do that. But if you're going to be working in this field, um, if you're going to be searching for answers to the question that animates every film we've made, who are we? who are these strange and complicated people who like to call themselves Americans, you're going to bump into a lot of different stories. <laughs> and if you resegregate yourself into one particular, uh, you know, uh, furrow uh, and not see across the whole field, you have blinded yourself. And I am not willing to do that. I cannot not tell a complete story of the Civil War and label it as I did for the first time in popular film history that the cause was slavery, not states' rights. And by no means were the Ku Klux Klan the heroes of our story as they are in Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind. And so if you want to tackle baseball, you're going to tell the story of Jackie Robinson, the most important moment in the history of baseball. If you're going to do with jazz, you're going to understand its African-American roots. If you're going to tell the story of the national parks, you're going to find out that the first protectors of those parks, well before anyone even thought of a national park service, were the Buffalo soldiers, the African-American cavalrymen who protected Yosemite and and uh, what is now uh, uh, Redwoods and uh, Yellowstone from poachers and uh, and other herders and other encroachers. So the story of America <clears throat> can, cannot be resegregated. If you're going to tell the story of country music, which is seen as a white, uh, a, a white music, you're going to learn to your surprise that the Mount Rushmore of country music, every single one of those figures on that mountain had African American mentors. So, you know, we are in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. And that's, that's, <laughs> I'm sticking by that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, we should certainly, we're coming now close to the true end, and we should end uh, certainly on Muhammad Ali. Um, as uh, the audience uh, should know, there is a Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville, Kentucky, where he was born, where he was from, uh, and where his uh, widow, Lonnie Ali, was also from. Could you comment on how Ali wanted to be remembered and the core principles he hoped people would take from his story? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the Ali Center is a really wonderful place if anyone has the chance to visit Louisville and see it. And I think it's important that it's in Louisville because of the way that the city was so central to shaping Ali. 
um, for better and worse. You know, I mean, there are the ways that he, you know, he grew up in the West End in Louisville, which was a black sort of middle class, lower middle class neighborhood where where there were black owned businesses and it was a it was a safe, supportive place. Um, but also Ali, young Cassius Clay, was very aware of the fact that he lived in a segregated city and the pain of that experience of knowing that there were places downtown that he could not go, that he could not eat, the amusement park that he could not go to because it was only for white families, um, that affected him deeply, um, along with his father's anger and frustration at not having the career opportunities that he believed he should have and that he believed were limited because of the color of his skin. And so all of that is part of it. But then you also have the Louisville sponsoring group, these white businessmen from Louisville who uh, band together to support Ali's initial career. And it's a, it's an, um, it's a, as, as our commentator Jonathan Ike says in the film, it's the greatest contract in the history of boxing. Um, but there's also something complicated about that in the way that these white men sort of own and control uh, this young man almost as if he were a thoroughbred horse that they might have have owned for the Kentucky Derby. So it's all really complicated, but Louisville is so tied up in his life and his experiences. And I think he um, felt really connected to the city even after he wasn't, you know, wasn't living there anymore. Um, and, you know, the, the center is, is um, focused on these core principles of Ali's life that I think are these aspects of who he was that, again, as we were talking about before, sort of carry through across his life, right? It's about his spirituality, about his generosity, about his confidence, these different um, parts of who he was that I think is what in, in what we were trying to do and tell his story was to weave all of those things together. Um, his dedication to his sport, you know, all of these, all of these aspects of his life um, and to understand them and their intersections and in who he was. Um, and so the Ali Center is really uh, a wonderful place if you ever have the chance to, to visit it. Yeah, it's confidence, it's conviction, it's dedication, respect, giving, and spirituality. Those are the six core uh, principles that the Ali Center, taking example from their namesake, uh, try to teach and practice. And, is the legacy of Muhammad Ali today. Well, thank you so much. I'm just going to jump in and I want to thank you, Ken, Sarah, and Faith for a fabulous conversation. 